What's got you all giddy? Jekyll asked me as he followed me out of the alley. Oh. Oh! Oh yeah, lad, you got my attention now. He said excitedly as I whispered the answer into his ear. My night just got so much better. I'm just glad this headache is about to be over. I sighed as we made our way through Elsian Park, pushing my bike through the grass whilst we walked. So you sure about this? Jekyll asked, almost tripping over a tree root. I mean, we ain't marching all the way out. Say, so, how exactly do you know where we're supposed to go anyway? I bought a few of these off the internet. They aren't as small as the movies make you think they'd be, but small enough to fit in a bag or taped under the seat of a car or something and not get noticed. I answered, pulling one of the small tracking beacons out of my pocket to show him. When Han asked me to figure out who killed Mark, I ordered several and started planning them on everyone I was suspicious of. Better safe than sorry. Luckily, the last one I planted paid off. <laughs> You're scary good at this, you know. Creeks me out sometimes. Might miss your calling, I think. Jackal said as he took the zippo-sized beacon from me. Hey, you ain't got one of these things on me, do you? Oi, do ya? I could hear him, but there was no way I was turning to look at him. As we walked through a small clearing, we could see under the trees at the other end. The white fabric waving softly in the wing. Hey, what's got you all? Well, I'll be bloody damned. There's a bird in a maid costume over there. Huh, not gonna lie. I thought you finally lost it, he said with a chuckle. When I didn't find any part of the situation funny, the realization that this was the first time I'd seen her whilst I was with someone else, it didn't feel good at all. Hey, you have any of your jukes still on you, Jackal? I asked nervously as I quickly opened the text on my phone and typed out a small message to the first random contact I was able to hit. Please don't call it that, but yeah, got a vial or two. Why? What's that matter? Because I feel like we might need it real soon. I answered as soon as we walked down into the clearing where we were. Take it. Take it now! I shouted as she got closer and closer. Jekyll, move your ass! I yelled as she began to speed up. Suddenly she dove for him. Not having time to do anything else, I hit Sen halfway through typing and threw my bicycle between them. I couldn't look away as I watched it be broken in half like a pencil, while sparks fall into the ground as each tumbled into the bushes. But I'd managed to buy Jekyll just enough time to... get punched in the chest so hard, her fist disappeared into it and sent him rocketing across the clearing into a sturdy tree. Run, boy! He managed to choke up through the blood before his eyes rolled into the back of his head and his body slumped over into the damp grass. You stay right there. The maid's voice hissed over to me before I could take a single step. I didn't have long to make a plan, so I bet everything on a shot in the dark. You... you should really wear a watch, I told her, showing off the one on my wrist Destiny bought me on our first date. Yeah, sure, I'll play along. Why do I need a watch? She asked as she rocked her head side to side with every rhythmic word. Because it keeps you from losing track of time, like when the sun's about to rise. I said as I looked at the tree line over her shoulder, and in that moment I could see for just an instant the look of panic on her face before her head whipped around to check to see if what I said was true. By the time she turned back around, I was already long gone into the trees. I'll give you credit. You had me going. You really did. I could hear her say after the soft hiss of her appearing somewhere in the dark off to my side. The second the words reached my ears, I stopped and dove behind the nearest tree. I tried desperately to quiet my breath as I listened to the soft hisses as she moved instantly from one place to another, searching the trees from my hiding place. Jose! Jose! I could hear a call from the darkness, my hands now shaking violently over my mouth to muffle my breathing. Jose... Found you! In an instant, she had appeared a few inches away from my nose and she shouted in my face. Shit! I screamed back as I tried to escape, but I felt something. A tug. My backpack. She had a hold of my backpack. 
Thick and quick, I slipped through the shoulder straps and took off back into the trees. Got your back, Jose! Shove it up your ass! I shouted back over my shoulder as I ran, tripping and stumbling over the limbs and the roots on the ground. As I ran, I eventually found myself in an old shed or shack. Some kind of old, rickety, wooden building near the edge of the park. I fell in head first as I pushed the door out of the way and began to fumble around with the little time I had left. Oh, say... I heard the words crawl through the air as the boards on the shed creaked under her feet. Time to go. No more running. I turned to face her, just managing to slide my shoe back on before she walked inside and felt my blood run cold. I started to shiver and shake as she inched closer and closer, the mania in her eyes brighter than ever before as she loomed over me, long black talons tearing their way out of the tips of her white gloves. Then she reached a clawed hand down towards me and wrapped a hand around my neck. The next thing I knew I was on the cold concrete floor, puking my guts out. Grabbing my sides in pain, the injury to my ribs still not healed yet. Once I had boffed out all I had, I rolled over onto my back and tried to catch my breath before I heard people begin to speak. Alright, go ahead and search him. I heard a vaguely familiar voice say from somewhere out of sight as I began to feel hands picking and patting across my body. Don't forget to check behind my balls, no man's land. I groaned at them. Keep joking, asshole. See if that makes things better for you. One of the people searching me warned. And taking his warning to heart, I replied. Your mom thought they were funny. Which earned me a kick to my already hurt ribs. Oh my god! I wheezed, clutching my side. Be with you in a moment. The familiar voice spoke again. And I rolled to my other side to see an old Middle Eastern man in all white. He was sitting in a concrete throne of some kind, writing something down, some kind of sheet of paper resting between the folder. Yahweh, I kind of figured. I sighed to myself once they were done violating almost every inch of what used to be my personal space. You gonna tell me what the hell this is, or do I have to figure out it all Scooby-Doo like? I asked, shrugging the maid's hand off my shoulder. Oh, of course, of course, he said as he closed the folder and stood from his seat. No need for the deception at this point. You are brought here for two reasons. The first, to put it simply, is as a hostage. You've managed to wedge yourself under the skin of several very prominent figures in the paranormal world. If you're in my possession, then I can do as I please without resistance from them. And the other reason? That one is a little more complicated, he said as he walked over to me. The second reason is, well, I want to convince you to... Oh, wait, one moment, please. He added, turning to face the guy who kicked me in the side. I believe I was very clear about not harming him. But I must have been mistaken, since I know you couldn't have possibly done something I told you not to do. Oh, well, I, uh, I, uh, the guy stuttered, already almost in a panic. Please, I didn't mean to. Shh, I apologize. I may have lost my temper for a moment, but I can't punish you in some way. It would reflect poorly on me. He said to the man, patting him on the shoulder. So how about a simple demotion, and we call this whole unpleasantness settled? Oh, yes sir. Thank you. The man heaved a sigh of relief. Never happen again, I swear. I understand. If you follow Scheidenfraun, she will take you to your new position and help you get settled in. He told the man, and that's when I finally made the connection. I know some of you may have figured it out by now, but I had so much going on that it never occurred to me before that moment. Son of a bitch, it was her all along. I thought as she walked the man out of the large room we were in. A demotion? Demotion to what? I asked, 
You don't strike me as the administrative punishment type. He'll be in the food department, he answered quietly to me, a sly tone in his voice, which made me glance back over to see the maid glance back over her shoulder at me with the most malicious smile I'd seen from her so far. At least I don't have to see it happen, I thought to myself as they disappeared from view. So, you're saying about that second thing? Ah, I was, wasn't I? He asked to himself as he ran the stark white beard through his hand. The second reason I brought you here. I want you to work under me and my modest organization. Yeah, okay, I'm in. Can I leave now? There's that famous wit of yours. However charming it is, you'll have to be more convincing than that. He said as he stood face to face with me. First, let me present my case. Sit, he instructed, pointing to a small chair that had been left in the room with us. Knowing I didn't have much choice, and that he was probably about to start monologuing again, I went ahead and sat down. Once I was in the chair, he started speaking again. You've been involved in the paranormal world for some time now, correct? He asked much more directly than I expected. Tell me what you think of that. He went on, a genuine sincerity in his voice as he spoke. Not expecting to be asked a question, it took me a second to collect myself, and even then I had to think about it for a while before I could answer. Honestly, at least. I don't like it, I said plainly. I don't mean them, for the most part. But the world they live in? I kinda hate it. I didn't think about it at first. It took a while. It didn't really sink in until I met the right people and started noticing things. It's not right. It's like segregation and exploitation and it don't sit right with me. A lot of them are forced to hide away from regular society. Creep around in the dark corners. Live in shithole run-down places. The closest they got to someone looking out for them is fucking Dirty Work Inc. and Dr. Jekyll of all people. And if that ain't enough, if they want something to eat, they gotta pay someone out the ass to have it delivered so someone doesn't chop their heads off because they watch too much TV. And that delivery? You know what that shit costs? I've been finding every excuse I can lately not to make deliveries because I can't not think about it. I explained. Not expect me to be the one monologuing. Ah, there it is. He responded excitedly to my words. You hit the nail right on the head, and that's precisely what I intend to fix. I want to give them a better option than this rough feudal system they have now. Me and my angels can give them that. But we need them to be on our side first. It has to be a collective choice they make. Violence only gets you so far. Yeah, manipulation gets way better results. Exact. No, that's... I didn't mean it that way. He corrected himself. It's enticement. I simply offer something better. After that, they're free to choose which they prefer. Me, or the alternative... Just, can I ask you something? Of course. Ask any question you like. He asked cheerfully. Anything at all. Why are you focusing so hard on the paranormal types? I mean, what about everyone else? <laughs> what about everyone else? He suddenly roared into my face. Oh boy, I feel an evil monologue coming on, I thought to myself during the outburst. But instead of saying anything, he just... Reached to in his pocket. And after fishing around for a second, he suddenly tossed something metal into my hands. A quarter. Tell me what this coin says. He said as I caught it. In God we trust. Who do you think I am, Jose? Really think before you answer. In fact, let me show you something. He said as he opened the drawer on the table next to me and produced a Bible. Have you ever read this book? I get curious every now and then and take a quick look. 
It's good for a laugh here and there, watching them slowly change what it says over the years. But listen to this for me, won't you? He continued as he flipped through the pages. Ah, here we are. Numbers. 31, 17 to 18. It's a King James, so do pardon the wording. Now, therefore kill every male among the little ones, and kill every woman that have known a man by lying with him. But all the women children that have not known a man by lying with them, keep alive for yourselves. He read before closing the book with a loud pop and tossing it over his shoulder to the floor. Do you follow that, Jose? Do you understand what it is saying? That was part of a story where Moses was roaming the land with the Hebrews and raiding other tribes. And in this story, they killed the adults but spared the children. When Moses learned about it, he became enraged, then tells them what he says I wanted them to do. That they were to go to the next tribe and slaughter all of them. Men, women, children. Ah, but not the little virgin girls. No, not them. They were to be taken as what I believe today you would call a sex slave. Do you understand the implications of that, Jose? I can see the expression you have, but no. I never commanded that. The times were different. I was different. I led my people to war with other tribes many times before I was worshipped as one of their gods. But I have always taken a very hard position on those practices. But the people who believe this book to be true, to be accurate, they do think I said to do exactly that. And yet they still worship me. I've been told you like cinema. Well, let me offer you a quote from a film I'm quite fond of. That is the kind of power you can't buy. That's the power of fear. He kept speaking as he pulled a phone from his pocket and turned it on. After poking at it for a few seconds, he slid it across the table to me. Do you recognize that person? That is the person who is currently the vice president of this country. In the video, he is standing before Congress arguing that the world is only 6,000 years old because he thinks that the book says so. He explained as he took the phone back from me. See the dots on this map? Quite a few of them, would you say? Yeah, show me a world map on the screen with a bunch of red dots all over it. Each of those dots is an individual country in which openly stating you don't believe in me awards you the death sentence. You ask about the rest of the people. Jose, I have them. I've had them for centuries. That work is done. The tone in his voice, the actual understanding of what he just said, was the moment I really began to understand why so many godlike paranormals came together against him. And it sent an icy chill through my veins as he spoke the words. I think I get it now. There's really not much anyone can really do to stop you at this point, is there? I asked as I felt my heartbeat speed up a little more from the nerves. Look, for the record, I'm not happy about what I have to do here. Well, given the situation, I think... I spoke as my words began to get softer and softer. Speak up, Jose. He told me as he leaned in to listen. <laughs> I spat dead in his face. The second he was close enough, I knew I wouldn't miss. Fuck you, you Colonel Sanders looking fuck! I yelled as his head snapped back in surprise. Don't bullshit a bullshitter. You want to lie to my face and think I'm gonna roll over for you like a fucking puppy? Or what? You don't think I've spoken to Abigail since you showed up? You don't think I know about your history? You burn your handprint into Destiny's neck! Help you? I wouldn't piss up your ass if your guts were on fire. It took a second for him to collect himself, and the look he gave me, I was pretty sure that was about to be the last thing I ever saw. And I honestly have no idea what possessed me to do that. 
I had every intention of playing it cool and then finding a way to escape. But I don't know. Those two thoughts about Destiny and especially Abigail hit me at once and BAM! I full of loogie. Which, admittedly, I felt some regret over at the time. After he cleaned himself off and straightened up, he took a deep breath as he called. Schadenfraud, could you come in here for a moment? He asked loudly but politely, which I couldn't help but think seemed out of character given the situation. What do you want? She asked as she poofed into the middle of the room. What happened to you? You look pissed, she asked with a small giggle. Never mind. Do you please take our guest into the other room? I think we're done for now. What? The other room? No. Hell no, that's my room. That's the only place I have to myself around this damn place. Just take him to the other room! He suddenly and angrily shouted at her. And then she gave him the most indignant look I'd ever seen in my life. Her head moved back, chin tucked in, eyes got real wide as she sat down at him. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. I just... We can't have him out here. This is where we do all the meetings and offerings and... It just... Looks unprofessional. Will you please, please take him into the other room for now? Holy shit. He's scared shitless of her. I thought to myself as I heard the sudden change in his tone and saw the slightest shaking of his legs as he spoke to her. What does he know that I don't? As she led me away, I couldn't help but make awkward conversation to pry a little. You finally gonna tell me who you really are? I asked as she moved forward. I know, you're shading fraud. And I think I hate you even more now, but... Shut up, sit down, and leave me alone. She suddenly barked as she opened a thick metal door and pushed me through it. This is my room. You don't bother me in my room. You understand? People in your space when you don't want them there. I can only imagine how annoying that must be, I said sarcastically as I looked around. Sorry, I'll be quiet, I added when I saw the look she gave me. Continuing to look around the new space, I started to take in the surroundings. On the far wall was a small flat screen TV sitting on top of a few of those old milk crates. Besides it, there was a laptop with something running on it. On the floor, there were several game systems along with stacks and stacks of DVDs and games all over the place. Move. She hissed as she closed the door and pushed past me. Don't touch my stuff, she warned. I'm going to touch your stuff, I said softly to myself, the memory of her snapping my bike in half vividly in my mind. I'm going to touch the shit out of it. The second she turns her head, I'm dragging my balls across a keyboard. Just sit somewhere and don't move. Don't do anything. Just sit still. Hey, not for nothing, but the fuck's the deal? Ever since you showed up, I haven't had a moment's peace because you won't leave me the hell alone. I asked, almost mildly insulted. I like my privacy. I want one place I can go to get away from everything and everyone. And now you're in it. You're in that place. She answered grumpily as she turned the TV and one of the game systems on. Now shh. Why am I so offended by that shit? I thought as the Tomb Raider logo popped on the screen. While I was pulling up a spare milk crate and watching the loading screen, she took a deep breath and... As she exhaled, her maid outfit melted away in a flowing black mist. Once it was gone, all that was left was a loose black t-shirt with a skull in the front. Huh, she almost looks normal, I thought, once the stupid getup was finally gone. Then, after another breath, her clean-cut bangs grew and frayed out into something almost ragged and unkempt. 
About then, I couldn't help but think she reminded me of someone. I just couldn't remember who. You know, I kind of figured you'd be shacked up in some snooty mansion or something. It seems kind of out of character, I guess. I pointed out loud as my eyes fell on the cot she was sitting on. You ever live in a mansion before? I'm not fate, she said bluntly, staring at the screen for a while before letting her head roll back to look at me with her now tired and darkened eyes. But you're not as wrong as you think you are, she said cryptically. I fought the urge to ask if she was okay, you know, on account of her being an asshole and all. I mean, I know I'm on the good terms with Louie now, and he tried to kill me, but this woman tormented me day after day after day. And furthermore, the bitch broke my bike. The second priceless bike in, like, several months. So instead I went with... Game's ready. I told her, pointing at the screen. God damn it! She shouted as one of the guys with the huge metal shields killed her again. This is bullshit! You blasphemed? Yahweh asked as he pointed his head in from the main room a few seconds later. Not you! She shouted in frustration as she waited for her character to respawn. Oh, she's at those video games again. Hmm. <laughs> While I'm here, I was just about to send a few angels out to get food. Is there anything you two would, perhaps, like? He asked. Don't worry, I'll give you a second to let that whole thing sink in. It took a few seconds for me to process myself. After I had time to sort the situation out of my head, I answered, Before I say anything, I want to preface it with this. Ever since I got tangled up in this bullshit, I've had a lot of ridiculous conversations and unbelievable encounters. But this right here? This is by far and wide the last conversation I ever thought I'd have. So? Is a 20-piece chicken nugget and a large fry out of the question? I asked as I heard the game restart behind me. One of those big KFC buckets... And as many cups of macaroni and mashed potatoes as they'll let you have. The maid said as she continued to hammer away on the controller. And a Dr. Pepper. Big one. Yeah, I want a Dr. Pepper too. You need to do the duck behind pickaxe upgrade thing you got early if you want to beat that guy. I told her in the middle of one of her rage quits, my mouth full of chicken nugget. The duck what? She begrudgingly asked after a long pause. I didn't see any duck thing. Give me the controller, I said, sitting my nuggets on the nearest milk crate. You're killing me here. You gotta wait for the, what's it called, the quick time thing? Then you hit this button, and that makes Lara sidestep his ass and pickaxe him in the back. See? Just like that. Stop showing off, she hissed. Pulling the controller away from me. I'm not showing off. I just like the Tomb Raider games. I used to play this one a lot, and you just got impaled on the river barge. I sighed as she caused Lara to die yet again. Another gruesome death. Where's my chicken? Oh, never mind. There they are. A few hours later, I found myself standing over her with what felt like a shattered plastic milk crate in my hands. You know, I had to at least try. I whimpered as the sound of the last few pieces hitting the floor died down. Please don't eat me. I am trying to play my game. Next time, could you try something quieter like stabbing me with that knife you've got hidden in your shoe? It's all a calcum, right? Should at least sting a little. What? I don't... Fuck it. This thing hurts like a bitch anyway. I sighed as I slid my shoe off. Lou was right, though. I never check shoes. I mumbled as I took the knife Hook gave me out of my shoe and sat it on the table. So, using this on you wouldn't do anything at all? It'd make me mad. That's about it. So how'd you catch it when none of the other guys patted me down? I asked, scrimming my foot back down into my shoe. Was born under a full moon, you know. 
I, uh, huh? I had at the strange response. I don't know what my exact birthday is, only that it was around 12,000 BC and under a full moon, so that means I was born at night, but not last night, she said as she looked back over at me, causing a clinging piece of plastic to fall to the ground. Are there any of those chicken nuggets left? Uh, yeah, but are you like... Full after eating that huge bucket of fried chicken? And that guy? He's working in the cafeteria. We were trying to scare you into cooperating. He doesn't have the manpower to just kill everyone who kicks someone in the ribs, she casually explained. I'm still hungry. Where'd you put those chicken nuggets? They're here, here they are, I said, handing her the box with the last few nuggets in them. Give me one of the drinks out in the mini fridge beside you. She orders as she opened the box. The fuck is Grapico? I asked as I saw the entire row of purple soda cans. Yeah, give me one of those. She instructed, blindly reaching her arm back and wiggling her fingers at me. That doesn't really answer my question, but here. I grumbled as I passed her the can. Hey, can I have one of your yogurt? If you touch a single one of my yogurts, you'll what? I asked when she trailed off. I don't know. I'm too tired to think of anything colorful right now. I'm trying to play my games. She answered as she reached blindly behind her for the can. A while passed, and the next time she did anything noticeable was when she reached over and hit the eject button on the console. I sat and watched quietly as she took the old game out, put it back into its box, and slid a new one in. Is this really all she does when she's not screwing with me? I thought to myself as I sat behind her and looked around at the small, dimly lit, barren space we were confined in. I'd lose my mind in here. Eventually, my attention fell back on the TV as the new loading screen popped up. Hey, Singularity, I love this game. I accidentally said out loud. So it's good? She asked without turning around. I found it today at the used game store. Oh, uh, yeah. I started, not prepared for such a sincere, non-hostile question. It's pretty cool, I told her, shifting in place a little. I wasn't ready for the next question she asked. Is it scary? Is it scary? I repeated, ever more surprised than I already was. You know, jump scares... Does it have jump scares? Um, it's more creepy. I lied as I began to see the numbers start to add up. So I told her it wasn't. Just to see what would happen. The thing about this particular game is the first part is big, long, suspense build-up to a really good jump scare that comes out of nowhere. Try to keep in mind she's holding me hostage and she killed my bike. My bike. Just don't judge me. She had it coming. This isn't about Nazis, is it? She suddenly asked once the game started. But the way she asked was... Well, I was almost nervous. Um, no. Russians. It's like an alternate timeline where they find this new element in Russia that does all kinds of crazy stuff. But there's no... I stopped for a second before reaching over and hitting pause on her controller. Why do they call you Scheidenfrater? I asked, suddenly seeing another dot connect. Hey, why'd you? She started to shout at me, but then she stopped to answer. If I tell you, will you leave me alone and let me play my game? I never expected this shoe would fit so well on the other foot, but yeah, promise, I told her as I scooted my crate closer with a few small hops. Back in March of 1945, I got in a fight. That was when I learned about Akala. I guess I bit off a lot more than I could chew. Who? I had interrupted when I heard the unfamiliar name. Akala. It apparently means immovable. Fudomu is probably who you know him as. But Akala is what he used to be called. Whatever. 
Needless to say, he lived up to his name because he almost killed me. So all I could think to do was, what do you call it, poof myself away. I thought I'd try to get as far away as possible, so the other side of the planet sounded good in the moment. I forgot it was daytime on the other side of the planet. I was on the verge of death and wasn't thinking straight, but I ended up more dead than alive, outside, in the middle of the day, surrounded by snow, less than a mile away from a secret Nazi death camp in Denmark. Before the sun went down and I was able to heal and get away, one of the patrols found me. When he noticed the steam coming off of my body, he knew something was up. Then they took me prisoner and built this entire thing, facility, an underground prison around me and started bringing in different people to turn me into a lab experiment. They killed everyone they were holding there first. There was this man there, a scientist. A genius, really. I still remember his name. Oscar Vogel. He was the only one there that tried to get them to let me go. The only one with a shred of decency in that entire place. Anyway, I wasn't exactly comfortable there. Under the ultraviolet lights, they had me under 24-7. So I... Pick at them whenever I had the chance. You know what I'm talking about, she said, making me think back to the night in the woods when she made me see the visions. I nodded that I understood, trying to shut the traumatic memory back down. Think of what that was like, having something you feel such horrible guilt for, tormenting you for just a few minutes. Now imagine that every other day, over and over and over again, they started to catch on, and they started calling me shite on Florida. The pleasant feeling of seeing other people's misery. I was under those lights, burning constantly for almost sixty years. At some point I forgot my real name, so I just kept that on. It seemed to fit, after all, and I never used the old one that much anyway. Now can I play my game, please? Oh, wait, yeah. Sorry. That... Really, sixty years you were just burning alive. I couldn't help but ask. No, sorry, sorry, I, I promised, I said, shooting myself up and watching quietly as she resumed the game. It wasn't until a little while later that the thought occurred to me as I saw the jump scare coming up. It happens when you find a specific item and she was getting close, so I focused on her to see what would happen. And then my conscience got to me. I started to get this nasty feeling in my gut as I thought about his story. Hey, wait! I tried to tell her, but it was already too late. The monster popped out like it was supposed to. A scream echoed off the concrete walls as she vanished in a puff of black mist, leaving her controller to clatter to the ground. She's jumpy, I said to myself as I reached down to press the pause for her, the bro code overriding everything else and stopping the game so she didn't die. She didn't talk to me the entire time after that. Not until... Hey, get out here, she suddenly demanded, poking her head out of the door. He wants to have another talk with. She stopped, dead in her tracks, when she noticed a half-empty plastic tube of yogurt hanging out of my mouth. Skip ahead about 30 seconds, and now I'm being drugged across the floor by my ankle as I felt the knot in my head slowly growing. I came to a stop with the sound of my shoe thudding against the hard concrete as she let go of my leg with a little shove. So, I suppose you're all wondering why I gathered you all here today, I said once I noticed Yahweh sitting in his throne. There's that famous sense of humor, he said as he rose to his feet, precisely why I wanted so deeply to have you on board with us. 
All these paranormals really do seem to find you endearing. You'd be quite invaluable. Wow, no fooling? I asked in my best 1950s boy in a commercial voice. You mean if I work for you, I can have my own miserable concrete hole in the wall like her? I kept on sarcastically, pointing to the now seemingly disgruntled woman standing over me. What about milk crates and a riggedy cot? Can I have some of those too? We've had to make some sacrifices for mobility, he said through gritted teeth as he ran his hand down his beard in frustration. Now we've become more well established in the area, things will be more... That's your number one? I interrupted, pointing to Scheidenfraud, who was still standing next to me, and my place on the floor. Whatever scheme you're trying to pull, I can already tell you you couldn't do it without her. You're doing this only because you have her on your side. And you have her shoved all the way in the closet with nothing but milk crates and outdated video games for company. What possible benefit would there be in stabbing all my friends in the back for you when you can't even do right by her? As important as she obviously is in all of this. Jose, can I tell you why I began my conquest millennia ago? What made me such a threat to other gods? Will you just listen to the reason for my actions, then make your choice? He sighed as he rubbed his hands across his face. Oh great, another monologue! I bellowed when he was finished, before standing up and stomping my way back to the room, returning a few seconds later with one of the weird Grappico drinks from the mini-fridge. I slid the metal folding chair across the floor and flopped down in it before blurting out, Well, go on then. After a long pause, when he did nothing but glare at me, he finally said, Jose, I want you to understand that you're alive at this moment because I still feel like you hold some use to me. However, the moment that feeling goes away, I'll rip your arms off of your body and burn your eyes out of their sockets. I apologize for my outburst. Please continue. Hmm, of course you do. Where to begin? Well, once upon a very ancient time, I was a soldier of Canaan. You're talking about a very long time. 1400 BCE, somewhere around there. And at this time, we were on good terms with, I suppose, what you would call Egypt now. We would trade on large scales with the kingdom, partly for goods, partly to remain on good terms. This is where I learned that peace is preferable to war. Things go so much smoother this way. Apart from me being a soldier, which meant for me fewer battles, fewer opportunities to die. My fellow soldiers did not always share this perspective of mine. They could be rambunctious, easy to anger, prone to short-sighted decisions. Because of my level-headedness, I was very frequently charged with accompanying the trade caravans to and from Egypt, and eventually I was put in charge of the dealings between Canaan and Egypt. At the time, I had a family to think of, so I welcomed the elevation in job and status. Not the ones you may be thinking of. No, that's a story for another time. I refer now to a much more conventional family. Now, it is important to understand that, on a map, the distance from Canaan to Egypt might seem almost trivial by today's standards of travel. But on camel and horse and foot, it was something of a journey. But once we arrived at our destination, since over time I had fostered such a good relationship with the pharaoh, we were all taken care of during our stay. As I returned from one of these trade ventures, I arrived at my home on the edge of the city, excited to see my family after such a long time, only to find a pile of rubble and the pieces of what remained of my wife and children scattered everywhere. What happened? Where were the city guards whose jobs it was to protect them against this very thing? I found my answer in the form of something that had been left behind in the carnage. A small ornament, worn by the city guard around their necks as a symbol of the unit or squad, or whatever you like to call it, that they belonged to. 
shall I take this before the king and council? And they responded by doing absolutely nothing. They tell me without any witnesses they cannot know for sure who committed the act. I became violent and they threw me from the council building onto the street. I wandered the city aimlessly all night, not sure what to do, not sure what could even be done. I was broken, just a shell of the man who I was only hours before. And then I see down the street, words over the entrance to a building. What you would translate as worst hotel or lowest temporary home, same thing it means. My house is little more than a pile of rock and dirt at the time, so I walk inside and stay for the night. Well, I forgot that I had no way to pay for staying in this place. I left everything with my family before I departed for Egypt and had yet to be compensated for conducting the trade. For this, they tell me I'm to work there to repay my debt to them. Only right after I do find this is so much more than I could have imagined. Inside, it seemed to go on forever, defying all reason and logic. Creatures from nightmares called this place home, and place to work and go about their lives. And underneath was an entire world unto itself. An endless chasm of night full of these folding things called books and scrolls I had never seen before. In this place, I found one of these books written in a language I understood. A book you may already be familiar with. Why this was, I couldn't begin to guess. But the things it spoke of, the things it offered, they were precisely what I was looking for. The rage of what happened to my family still strong in my heart, I hid the book away for safekeeping. And then when my debt was repaid, I stole the book for myself and returned to my homeland. In the desert, I formed a band of brigands and made myself not only their leader, but eventually their god. The things I learned from the book made me indistinguishable from a deity to them who knew no better. Some years passed, and over that time, a small band of brigands became a larger army of soldiers. I broke down the walls of my old home and took it for myself. Every guard, every official who had a hand in what happened to my family was spread across the city. Their right arm to the east, their left arm to the west, their legs to the south, and their heads to the north so that they may always for eternity stand guard over the city, as was the duty they neglected. Soon after, the city itself worshipped me as a god as well, as I had brought my knowledge of trade and commerce to the people and let them thrive as never before. I looked at what I had done and saw it was good. That's when the idea occurred to me. Why not this, but everywhere? Why should anywhere in the world not prosper as my city now did? What if... What if all it took was to bring the world under one god? I was no fool. I had met many other gods in my travels through the desert. Even with my army, I was no threat to many of them. But I understood I didn't need to win some glorious battle with them, one by one until the world was mine. What if the people simply thought the world was mine. I could unify the world and rule it as one nation under God. Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, I said once he was finally done. Yeah, that sounds pretty neat, really. You can come out of that sounding pretty sympathetic. I could really get behind the guy in that story. Now skip ahead to the part where you meet Abigail. What does he mean by that? Shadden frowned, asked from behind me. What's your history with? She tried to continue, but before she could finish, someone came busting through the door, dressed in all white. All right, so we still have the perimeter around Tom's place. Nobody's getting in to fix it in all. Watch. Hey, Harley. Funny meeting you here. I said when she noticed me taking a sip from the soda can. Join us, won't you? 
I asked, waving her further into the room. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, she said, making an attempt to back out. No, it's quite okay. Please continue. Colonel Burnham Bush told her, also waving her in. Now, what were you saying, dear? Oh, yes, sir. Just that we're still keeping watch over Tom's building. Nobody's made any attempt to get in so far. But the angels stationed there are reporting extreme discomfort. Something about the place itself, they say. So we might have to at least rotate them out there to keep them focused and alert. She reported with a clipboard in her hand as she spoke, occasionally glancing over at me from time to time. Any word on Mark's murder? He asked as he walked over to her. Oh, um, not as far as we know. If anyone knows anything, they aren't willing to tell us. We offered the reward for information, but it's all turned out to be nothing. Hey, Harley, you gain weight? Looks like you've been eating pretty regularly lately. I asked, suddenly remembering the comment she made back when we first met about being a vassal that helps stay thin. Not judging, you know what they say. Thick thighs save lives, I mocked with a little grin. You're kind of mouthy for a hostage, aren't you? She snapped at me for the jab at her weight. And there it was, the nerve I'd been digging for. What? Not like you can do anything to me, right? I mean, you'd have to be really stupid to do something like that. Like, just ridiculously dumb to lay a hand on me when you know you aren't supposed to. I continued to mock, not wanting to miss this chance for anything. I knew I could really twist the knife in if she had to stand there and take it. Or else. Keep it up, Jose, you obnoxious bike-riding bastard. She warned as she clenched a jaw. You don't know what I... Harley, shut the hell up. I could see the rage in her eyes when I said that to her. She knew she could tear me apart, but she wasn't allowed to. And she couldn't if she wanted to. Not with those two in the room with us. So I just kept digging because she had it coming. Oh wait, I think your nose got bigger too. It's finally big enough so you can smell your own bullshit. You just have to keep pushing everything, don't you? She suddenly screamed at me. The nose always gets her. That night, I should have just buried that digger into your head instead of sticking it in the door. Save myself and everyone else the headache. But you already knew it was me who nailed the Navland card to your door, didn't you? I know you're clever like that. You pick up on those things. But I bet there's something you don't know about that night. She ranted as a grin started to finally leave my face. Harley... Careful, I warned as we locked eyes, now serious as a heart attack. I bet you didn't know that I was the one who put the idea in Pan's head to have Julie kill. He thought someone like her would help you keep up an innocent appearance. It took a lot of convincing, but he finally agreed to let Croc after her. She revealed with the nastiest smile I'd ever seen her wear. She did it. I'm sorry, she did what? Yahweh asked, but the immediate look of terror and clarity that washed over Harley's face told him everything he needed to know before I could even say it. She did it. She killed Mark, I said, staring dead into Harley's petrified eyes the entire time. I put all the time frames together, found her on security cameras in the area near the time Mark would have died. She has motivation, and because of you, I pointed at the tiny wing on her finger, she had the means to kill him in the way he was murdered, beaten to death by someone inhumanly strong. Ah, no, he's lying. You told us all not to, so why would I? Why would I do that? She whimpered as he turned to face her. Shh, he hushed her, placing a hand on his shoulder. I understand. Just tell me the truth, and all will be forgiven. I'm sorry. I couldn't help it. I just wanted to hurt him a little, but I lost it, and... She told him as she started to cry. P Please don't kill me. She pleaded as she pawed at his jacket suit. 
No. I wouldn't dream of it. He assured her as he placed a hand on her cheek. You are, after all, a valuable and treasured follower. However, he said, suddenly sharpening his tone as he wrapped his hand around her entire face, an example must be made. He snarled as his hand slowly began to glow white hot again, causing the skin underneath to sizzle and pop as it burned from the unbearable heat. I couldn't help but look away as the muffled screaming started, and she began trying in vain to claw his hand away from her face, burning her hands along with it in the process. I looked over just in time to see Scheidenfraud wince just a little too. Come, I think the conversation's over. She said as she led me back to her room. We could both hear from inside as several other angels came in and drug her away as she continued to scream and cry in agony. So was it worth it? She asked when the screaming finally died down. If you think that was bad, just wait until Han Lao finds out and gets all her. I answered as I sat on the nearest plastic crate. Then the day finally came. Hey, wake up. It's festival day and I have to do this stupid song and dance, she said as she kicked me in the shoulder. Uh, and I need to be awake for this. Why? I asked from my place on the floor. Because I won't be here to watch you, and I'm not leaving you here alone with all my stuff. I'm supposed to lock you in the little room on the other side whilst I'm gone, she explained shortly. Now get up. Oh, fine. Just don't poof me, I'll walk. I told her as I stood up and adjusted my shorts before rubbing the sleep out of my eyes with a long yawn. Leave it, she warned as she saw me reaching for the knife Hook gave me. Nice try, but no, she added, shoving me out the door. That's when she walked me across the front room where I had the conversation with Yahweh and into a much smaller closet, like the room on the other side. Hey, wait, what if I have to go to the bathroom? I asked as she slammed the door and left me alone. Alrighty then, let's get the hell out of here. I said to myself as I started to fish the pieces of metal wire out of my shorts waistband, and I stashed in there before I got kidnapped. The whole reason I stuffed the knife into my shoe was to take attention away from the few pieces of electrical fence line I had hidden in my shorts that I found in the shed. Louis, you're a menace to society, but I gotta remember to thank you after this, I whispered as I bent the wires into the right shape to get the door's latch and pop it loose. Heh, <laughs> ain't I a stinker? I giggled to myself as I peeked down and looked around to see that nobody was standing guard over me. They're gonna be pissed about this one, I thought as I snuck out and crept across the room's open floor before walking right out the front door. By the time I could see the front of the Count's mansion, I could barely breathe. I haven't ran the entire way there. Since they were trying to work over the LA area, they luckily weren't that far. But sprinting on foot is still sprinting and I was almost ready to pass out as I drug myself up the long driveway to the manor. Sorry, fella, can't let you in right- Louis started to say when I tried to walk in through the door. You fucking with me? He suddenly shifted gears as he poked and prodded me all over to make sure I was real. Hey, hey, easy, just- Where is everyone? I asked once I got him calmed down. Oh, they're around back. Destiny's up on the balcony. I think they're getting ready to tell everyone you're missing. He told me as he stepped out of the way to let me through. You, uh, you want I should go with you? Oh, um, no. No, you might want to stay here and keep your eye open. Those asshat angels are planning something tonight, and I don't know what exactly. You do more good down here. And I said as I took off into the manor. Oh, and Louie? I owe you one. You don't even know. I added as I tossed him the twisted piece of wire. Before I made it to the stairs, I ran across a table full of snacks and junk. I could hear my stomach growling by that point, so I grabbed one of the tiny sandwiches and ran... Uh, wobbled up those steps before my legs could give out. 
I could feel myself almost cry when I finally reached the balcony and saw Destiny and Rissa next to each other near the rail. By then, I could hear Shiden fr God, I don't want to type that out every time. Yeah, screw that. Back to just the maid. By then, I could hear the maid's voice from the edge as they looked down at her. Since they hadn't seen me yet, I decided to give myself a few seconds to catch my breath and wipe the sweat off my face before I did anything else. And then I heard the Count say something about how they're supposed to know I was still alive. So, I figured I should probably make my grand entrance. Yeah, right? No proof of life or nothing. Worst rent you ever, you ask me. I said with a mouth half full of sandwich as I walked up to the edge of the balcony, giving the maid a little way from my perch. I took a second to really enjoy the look of boiling rage and confusion on the maid's face before I added, You guys tried these tiny sandwiches yet? They're pretty great. Help support the author on Patreon. Link in the description below.